So I got this uh, spreadsheet here with about 25 or so properties that uh, I don't know who gave it to me. They just emailed, randomly emailed it to me. But I thought it'd be good to just use it as an example of, you know, how do you sort through all these uh, properties? And um, I like Excel, and I know a lot of people do. Uh, if you don't like Excel, maybe you shouldn't be a real estate investor, or maybe you should find someone who is good at Excel. So uh, the spreadsheet uh, has zip codes, counties, bedroom, bath, square footage, the ages of the properties, that gives the monthly rents, which I think is a is this is an important column here, the taxes and insurance. Uh, again, this is from the seller. So uh, everything is subject to verification. And this net income column, I don't know what the heck this column is for. I would just disregard it. And the asking price, uh, that's another very important column. And I added this other column on here, the REV ratio, which is very important. Um, it's kind of the first thing that I look at when I'm trying to analyze properties. Uh, the seller and um, creator of this original spreadsheet put this return column on here. I don't really know what it's doing. I guess it's pulling the net income divided by the asking price. And then the asking price is just entered in randomly. So that really doesn't mean anything to me. Um, I'm going to look at the rent to value ratios first. Um, what I did is I you know, right click, made a new column made the RV ratio this cell divided by this cell to get the month, monthly rent divided by the asking price to get the RV ratio percentage. Next thing I did was I put some col colors on here so you guys can kind of see what I'm talking about. This asking price I put in green and like I said that's very important along with the monthly rent. A lot of our uh, numerical calculations are going to be based off the monthly rent and the asking price. The square footage is a very big uh, KPI for you software folks out there. Um, the price of the home is usually, and, and also rent is usually determined by how big the home is. Uh, also got the year, which kind of correlates to the age of the property here. I don't think, I think this is a pretty weak uh, key performance indicator. You know, obviously, I prefer newer properties. Like you know, this 2007 property is pretty new, and just because they have a you know newer curb appeal, and they typically have the newer floor plans that people like. But not to say that a house from the 1940s or 1980s is bad. You know, the newer house could use you know those green really junk materials, and the house from the 1940s could be made with very good materials. We don't know. I mean, it could be the completely the opposite way around. I mean, I'm not a carpenter. I'm an investor. So I'm just going to kind of just, I don't know. I don't have any strong correlation either way. I mean, yeah, again, I like newer properties, but it's really not that big of a deal, I think. Another thing that I look at is the bedrooms and baths. Um, bedrooms, I try and stay at three bedrooms at least. Two bed, there's no two, or there's one, here's one two bedrooms. And wow, it's, um, this is kind of a bad property actually. Look how expensive it is and you're getting like a two bedroom, one bath. I mean, that's, you know, for these C, B class properties, I mean, a two bedroom is, it's almost like a shack actually. I've seen some of these properties. Um, bathrooms, I would like to stay with properties that have at least two bathrooms because it helps you resell. One bathrooms are just always just harder to resell to a, a retail or you know regular person to buy, not a non-investor, because it's hard to it's hard to justify just one bathroom these days. I mean, I stayed in an Airbnb with a bunch of people and there was only one bathroom and it was just chaos. Again, the, the opposite side of the coin on that one is one bathroom. Well, now you only have one, one set of uh, sinks and plumbing that can go wrong. So, you know, there's always two sides of the coin. Kiyosaki said there's actually three sides of the coin. 
But this is another thing to keep in mind. I like to stay with properties that I can sell after five years is my exit strategy because something that I've learned as an investor, you always keep a property shorter than you actually think. There's always some you always get you're always improving and finding something better than what you're investing today. And it's not that you should wait for you, your knowledge to catch up. But that just seems to be how this game is played. Always be thinking of the exit strategy in mind. That's why I don't like duplexes, triplexes, or quads, because it's just tough to sell those things. I don't believe in that whole saying of buy real estate and never sell. I think that's, that's ridiculous. I, the way I do it is I calculate my annual return my total return on equity and in the beginning you're making pretty good money on these properties you know higher than 25 percent usually and when your equity goes up you know your returns kind of dwindle down so I you know when I my return on, on equity kind of gets below 15 percent I'm gonna look to re-leverage and move into the next property uh, next column is the square footage I really like to stay above 900 square feet it just seems to me that anything less than 900 square foot uh, is gets a little small, and again, that affects the resale of the pro property and your exit strategy. Uh, a couple things to point out here: taxes, insurance. The seller put all the insurance as $600. Obviously, that's not the case, and it kind of shows that the the person selling this it was a little lazy in putting this together. Uh, often, broke, a lot, most of the brokers are pretty lazy. You got to find the good ones, who aren't. Taxes, a lot. Of, you know, you just have to verify this stuff on your own. I think that's why these ones are in red because they're just totally bogus, and they just they felt so bad of just throwing this this number that's not in there that they wanted to make it red at least. I don't know. I'm just making that up. But a lot of these properties, you're buying it. Um, they're buying it for you know like half of the value that they're selling it at, and that's the kind of the reason why the taxes are so low. So one year, two years goes by, and you're ho you're holding onto the property. You might see this column jump up quite a bit. So the next thing I usually do is this is the same chart, but just I, what I did is I added the conditional formatting onto the rent to value ratios so you can see the lower ones showing up in red and the green ones showing up in green. Uh, the rent to value ratios are ranging from 1.5 to all the way down to 0.6 percent. So the next step that I will do is I'll kind of go into some of these key performance indicators that I was talking about. Um, I made this one chart here, the monthly rent divided by the asking price. So what this chart is showing as the rent goes up, the asking price for the property, well, this line is going down, which I think is a little bit of an anomaly. And it usually, you know, they usually correlate together. I think, if, I mean, you can tell by the data that it's not very tight and there's quite a few outliers kind of distorting this line. But it's usually, as the rent goes up, also, the price of the property goes up. Uh, next chart I have here is the monthly rent in comparison to the square footage. So as I said, the square footage is a very big key performance indicator for the rent on these properties. Uh, as you can see, it's a linear relationship. Well, I don't know if it's a linear relationship, but, but I, I believe it is. It's um, the more rent, the more square footage you have, the higher the rent that you're going to command. And that makes sense intuitively. The last graph I have down here is the rent to value ratio in relation to the asking price. And I've had a blog article that went in depth with this. And what this is saying, as your price goes up, your rent to value ratio goes down, but not as a, in a linear fashion. So this line is not straight. There's somewhat of a curve to it. And as an investor, you're trying to find that sweet spot. You know, what, what level of rent-to-value ratio are you looking for? Obviously, an idiot would say, oh, I want the highest one. But my friend, these are the D and F properties. And here in the 1% area, 
just for you know for this Atlanta, you have the B's and C's, and here are the B pluses and A's here. Right around this 0.8% rent to value ratio in Atlanta, I know that at if you go anywhere lower than that, you're not going to cash flow. And anywhere above this 1.2 rent to value ratio, you're probably going to need to carry a gun to go collect your rent. So in this case, you want to kind of be in the middle if that's your strategy. Again, there's more risk reward with these C class and D class properties. There's no answer to what your strategy is, is going to be. My strategy has always been to go after the B properties because I wanted a little less headache. If I was going to buy more of these properties, I might dabble in the more C properties because I'm a little more experienced and I know what I'm, I'm doing and I know how to manage a property management company a little better. And you know, I can handle a little bit more risk and, a little more, and get that extra reward. But I think for most people starting out, a B plus property is, should be kind of the goal. The next spreadsheet I have here uh, what I did here is I added, what I did is I, I highlighted this top row and I did a data filter. And what that does, it puts this little tab here and allows you to manipulate the rows of the cells. Um, again, you know, the six cell stuff is not for everybody. Um, you need to have some level of competence in it. If you don't, you need to uh, have someone who can help you learn it. Um, single family homes are pretty easy. You don't quite need it, but it really helps to visualize this stuff and get a sense of it. So what this function is going to allow me to do is rank these properties. Um, because I selected this column, I'm going to rank them from the rent-to-value ratios. So all the, the highest rent-to-value ratios are going to be at the top and the lower ones on the bottom. And a novice would be like, oh, I want these five properties because they're the highest rent-to-value ratios. But then I'll say, well, now you're buying all the D properties, you know, like as I said before. And these are all the properties that are kind of sold to unsophisticated investors. And they get kind of, they just get awed by these high rent-to-value ratios and these high rents. But in really, in actuality, there's so much headache with these properties for a new investor that I would not recommend that. I would kind of stay in this 1.1 1 .1 to 1.9 area. You'll still cash flow and you'll kind of minimize that, that headache factor or I call it the PETA factor, the pain in the ass factor. There, then, as I said before, when you go below this 0.8 rent to value ratio in Atlanta, you're probably not going to cash flow. You're, you're probably not going to collect enough rents to be able to pay all your expenses. So anything below here is just no bueno. And anything here, these D-class properties, I just wouldn't touch. And I typically buy things that are 1%. So here's something that I would probably get, 1%. But I'm looking at it, and you know, for one percent, I usually pick up properties that are about at least 850, maybe 900. So I'm just looking at this list in general. These none of these properties really appeal to me. They're really not that great. So um, yeah, you know, got 27 properties, 20, you know, 25 properties, and I wouldn't pull the trigger and do anything with them. But let's just say there was one pro property on here that you did like. Uh, the next step would be to enter in a purchase and sell agreement and do your due diligence. Again, you know, none of these, these columns like the taxes or insurance are verified. But um, I'm going to run the numbers on what your next step on analysis. So once you've kind of done your rent to value ratio analysis, you need to kind of go into the second phase. Uh, this spreadsheet here this is kind of a bad example of a spreadsheet to use for your analysis. It is a little complicated, but the one thing I like about it is it shows all the expenses that, that you could incur. And it really helps you brainstorm and think about these things because you need to underwrite it in your cash flow analysis to ensure that you have a 